Welcome back to the Compass Podcast. Today on the show, we have Anthony Power, an independent mining analyst. Anthony talks shop about the state of public markets, including miner efficiency, how to value a Bitcoin mining company, and if smaller players can outcompete against larger, more well-financed players. This podcast is presented ad-free by Compass Mining, the largest marketplace for Bitcoin mining. Check out compassmining.io today if you want to buy, sell, or host an ASIC. And now, onto the show. Anthony, welcome to the Compass Podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. I've really enjoyed your writing to date for us as an independent analyst. And I also know that a lot of Bitcoin miners out there are also enjoying it. You've just put a lot of nice touch on your writing, use some nice voice, and then you also delve into the SEC paperwork that a lot of people are not willing to go into. Yeah, thank, thanks so much for having me. Um, it, it started really um, due, to the, due to the boredom of COVID. Um, I, I retired five years ago. I'm a qualified uh, chartered accountant uh, with a career predominantly in the military in the UK. Um, and my retirement plans were actually traveling, but two, two and a half years ago, um, that got cut short with, with the COVID and the lockdowns. And um, really, the, the, um, I, I started investing not in mining stocks, but in some, some of the sort of like blue chip stocks, the banking and the oil and uh, gas stocks. And um, by chance, I, I made an investment in a company called Marathon Digital um, back in December 20. And I, I purchased a stock at um, you know, a, a, a price. And within four weeks, it had like quadrupled in price. And it got me thinking, what have I done? I, I don't understand what's going on. I don't really know what I've invested in. It was very speculative. Um, I think I was sort of jumping on the sort of the, Bit, the Bitcoin FOMO at the time with, with, with um, the proxy stocks. So I started to sort of look into what I was doing more and started to do some research. And I followed um, another uh, a YouTuber called Blonity, um, who'd been producing content on YouTube for, um, for, for, for quite some time before I started investing in that area. And um, we, got, um, we got chatting together offline and um, we sort of become friends. And I explained I was an accountant. I was interested in sort of maybe doing some analysis. And so September last year, I think I, I put my first um, my first tweet uh, regarding the analysis, and um, it started from there. And um, it's sort of grown and grown. Um, trying to you know keep the uh, information up to date. Um, I obviously Mara was my first investment. I have invested in a number of other mining stocks, and most of them I do actually analyze. So it's sort of it's a it helps me keep in touch with my investments through the through the companies. Um, I look at the, the three key areas I look at. I look at the um, the performance of the company. So I'm looking every month at how they perform with the hash rate that they're disclosing, and that's really key. Um, if you're disclosing a hash rate, you're giving an understanding to a shareholder uh, the anticipation of how many Bitcoin you should be able to mine with that hash rate. It's not really rocket science. I mean, we know what the global hash rate is. We know what the company hash rate is. And we can determine fairly accurately, taking into account the difficulty of the system, how many Bitcoins you would normally expect to to mine. And I started doing this analysis, and it, and, and, and there's, a, there's a very big disparity between all the companies that I analyze and some that are producing literally 100% of what they should be producing and some of the companies producing far less. Um, and those are quite, you know, quite clear to see through, 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 my, through my Twitter feeds. Um, and, and basically, it just, just started from that point. So, Yeah, you've definitely brought in a, a lot of, how should I say it, like uh, authority to what you're writing about because you just do it in such a professional manner. And there, there's been a lack of people who are doing this. So I think there has been some people in the past. Uh, Wolfie Zhao at The Block is one. Matt Yamamoto, formerly of The Block and Coindesk, uh, is another person. Uh, but a lot of these people have moved on to different jobs or they analyze different parts of the sector. And uh, we've seen a proliferation of... Uh, Bitcoin mining companies this year go public. I think about 20 went last year and more expected this coming year as well, uh, if markets maybe get a little bit better. Yeah. Uh, so there, there's definitely a lot of room for analysis. And there's been a few companies doing it, mostly research uh, places like Galaxy Digital has also done a, a good job with it in CoinShares. Uh, I should 
shout out them as well. But there's there's definitely a lack, I think, of of good quality analysis of these companies. And that's a shame because there's so much information, right? Like you just you said that yourself. Like hash rate is such a, a useful tool for analyzing how you're going to invest into a company. And for uh, TradFi, uh, you often don't get a lot of these metrics because uh, they're not public, right? That's the, the nice nature of the Bitcoin blockchain is that you have a lot of these metrics available and you can use them to analyze things. It's very simple to go from hash rate to cash flows and see like, why is this hash rate not producing this adequate amount of cash flows compared to this other company? And this is where I'm going to put my money. Uh, obviously, on this show, we're not giving investment advice, but we are going to delve into the analysis a little bit. So Absolutely. let's let's keep rolling here. Uh, I'm curious, just from a layman's perspective, and when you started getting into independent analysis of these things, what were the you you mentioned the the one metric that you use and some other metrics? What was like the the first few things that you started looking at uh, when you were getting into this? When you started getting into the writing side of things, what? What were some simple decision makers for you when you were looking at Bitcoin mining companies and, and choosing their stocks for investments? So again, it was the operational performance is key. Um, looking at the valuation of the company, so um, and, and and the valuation of the company based on on their ability to mine Bitcoin um, profitably. Um, so I'd look at. I started doing analysis on the actual cost for each of the mining companies to produce a Bitcoin, the marginal Bitcoin cost. Um, from a gross margin perspective, so that's just taking the, the, the Bitcoin uh, revenue and deducting the electricity cost, the energy costs and that from that revenue, but also looking at what the the full operational cash cost of mining a Bitcoin. So that's taking away all the non-cash. The depreciation, ignoring that, ignoring the uh, stock compensations, ignoring any change in value of bitcoins, which do affect the um, the accounts, but they're not they're not cash costs. So I'm looking at real cash costs to determine a full cost. I did some analysis um, in November last year, and it showed that um, a number of the mining companies were able to mine. Their margins were in the sort of the high margins were 84, 85%. So the likes of Hive, Blockchain, Argo Blockchain, and Marathon Digital um, tended to p- produce Bitcoin at the highest margins from, a le- from an energy perspective. When you look down at the whole cost, it was again, it was the same three companies that were able to produce the full cost of a Bitcoin cheaper than some of the rest. Um, so valuation is really, really important. Looking at... Um, Looking at the, the revenues, the future revenues that they would achieve based on what they're doing at the moment and what they're saying they're going to do in the next 12 months. So most of these companies that we see now have have reasonably high hash rates, but if you look at what they're projecting in the next 12 months, it the, the landscape is significantly different. So if we take, say, Marathon Digital, at the moment they've got a hash rate of, I think, 3.9 exahash per second. If you look in one year's time from today's date, they're forecasting 23.3 exahash. So that's like a, an 8x in terms of size of the organization from where they are today in one year's time. That's that's a serious uh, increase. If we take Argo blockchain, Argo blockchain at the moment, a 1.6 exahash, they've just opened their flagship facility at Helios in Texas. And their plan to grow to 5.5 exahash. So again, that's, you know, nearly three to four X increase. Um, also with Helios, because they're going to use the immersion cooling technology there, they're already suggesting that we're going to see um, some um, improvements in the um, ability to overclock the machines that are put into the, into the fluid. And conservative estimates suggest something like 20 to 25% um, ability to overclock the machines, which means you get, effectively get a 20 to 25 um, percent boost in exahash for those machines that are in there. So that might take them closer to sort of the seven exahash based on them achieving that hash rate by the end of the year. Um, Riot Blockchain, um, another company that's um, got a, an enormous facility in Texas at the Windstone facility. They currently have um, a hash rate of close to five exahash, and they're going to grow to twelve point eight. But like Argo, two hundred um, megawatts of their power is 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 already been um, uh, used for immersion technology, and they're just they're actually got their miners 
going into there at the moment. So I would imagine the next couple of months we'll start to see the benefits of that of that system and be able to plan. But the likelihood is they'll get to sort of 14 or 15 exahash based on that technology and the conservative estimates that we they're, they're forecasting to, to be able to overclock the machines. And yes, before people say you're overclocking machines, there is an increase in the energy. Um, but the increase is probably in parallel to what the normal usage is. So, And actually, it might be a little bit favourable. There might be some benefits because you don't use all the components of a miner when you put them into fluid. So you don't need fans on a miner, which probably accounts for about 5% of the power cost um, in air-cooled. So you do make s- some savings. Um, and it's down to the, the chief mining officers who will do the sort of analysis as to what the optimum setting is to get the best hash rate at the best value for energy so they can they can sort of like play with the with the numbers to make sure they get the optimum use out of it so that just gives you an indication those three companies there who are where they are at the moment reasonably sized mining companies going to be really big mining companies by the end of 2022 going into 2023 Uh, one more company iris energy have a hash rate at the moment of about one extra hash and this time, uh, sorry, in September next year, they're planned to be 15.2 exahash. That's a 15x increase. So you can sort of see it's a, it's, it is becoming sort of what we call a hash rate um, growth uh, race. You know, the company that gets the most hash rate inevitably might win the race. Um, but there are issues There are issues to that, and we, we can talk about those if, if, you, if you want yeah, let's get into miner performance. So I love the the landscape you've just painted where every single public mining company is racing to deploy more hash rate and it's often by multiples. And speaking of multiples, we can we can get into that in like a few minutes here talking about like why stock prices trade multiples above like hash flow or hash rate rather. Uh, but I'm curious to get a little information about mining performance. So I'm just going to read a quote from a recent article you published with us. Uh, you said, what the table also highlights is that Hive blockchain has effectively produced approximately 50% more Bitcoin per exahash of hash rate than both Marathon Digital and Argo blockchain over the period. This was published at the end of April. As stated above, numerous external factors can lead to lower performance percentages than anticipated. For example, curtailment of power has occurred in North America in recent months, caused by an increase in domestic demand for said power due to the colder weather. Both BitFarms and Hive blockchain report in their monthly updates periods where significant curtailment occurred. So curtailment is one example of a performance issue, a reason why you have hash rate and you're not getting as much Bitcoin out of it as you should based on paper. Uh, But curtailment is just the beginning, right? So what are some other things you've seen in the disclosures or the analysis that you've done that have led to uh, depreciated performance over a certain period? Yeah, well, you mentioned Argo blockchain and... um the, the the biggest problem they've had over the last sort of six to eight months is the S17 miners just haven't been performing anywhere near their expected output. They've had significant problems, um, and hopefully I think these miners have now been shifted to Helios to put in the immersion cooled system. Um, I would imagine they've done some testing there to to, to make sure that, that, that you know the work because they, it looks like from, the, from when we saw the... Um, that the boxes that were being stored were full of S17 miners. So, you know, that's that's been um, um, explained by Argo in various updates. They have had that issue. Um, other other reasons, um, Marathon Blockchain have a um, have the Harding facility, which is a which is a, next to a, a coal mining site, um, and they've had um, equal power issues at the site there. So they've lost power on certain days. Um, they are. They have put a public statement out to say that you know it's their intent to leave that facility, and they're 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 ramping up to to move into Compute North new facility in Texas, which is a a two hundred eighty megawatt facility. Um, that's that's happening as as we speak now. We're already starting to see the miners going in there to get that hash rate uh, ramping up. Um, I think having spoke to their CEO uh, Fred Teal um, early last week, they have something like twenty two thousand miners already um, set up, just needing the switch to be turned on. So they're waiting for the electricity permits to come through from the grid operator. Once they're through, 22,000, that's an extra 2.2 exahash immediately online. And they have something like 70 to 80,000 miners are waiting to be installed. So, you know, when we talk about that growth to 23, there's, there's you know, half that growth 
and just waiting to be switched on, installed and switched on. So, you know, they're, 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 it's been a delay, but they're starting to sort of make good on some of the original um, strategies that they, they, they put out there. Um, other reasons um, are effectively maintenance and software upgrades. Um, they'll play a part. Um, obviously, power, we talked about power in the fact that, you know, the power companies um, – really appreciate Bitcoin miners because what Bitcoin miners is it takes the load, the excess load off the grid as and when required. And these miners work in conjunction with energy providers to make sure they can they can ramp up and ramp down um, literally in minutes. So, you know, you have a facility of tens of thousands of miners. It doesn't take any longer than five to ten minutes to turn all those miners off and equally to turn them back on again there. Uh, and even quicker than that, I'm mean, hearing some miners are saying it's it's literally seconds they can they can make that switch, which is really effective because there are certain times of the day or maybe periods of the year where the domestic requirement does increase. So you can just imagine the morning when all the toasters get turned on at eight o'clock in the morning for breakfast, and say maybe in the evening when the evening meal, you know, the, the, you might have a spike in the energy. Well, the miners will work around that spike and curtail their power. Um, so that the domestic supply gets its full requirement, and then as soon as that 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 supply goes down, they can then ramp up their their, their power on on their machines and, and and work around it. And it works very very well because the power companies they have to provide the power to to meet the, the domestic requirement. But those those spikes are few and far between. It might be half an hour in the morning and half around the evening. So you have twenty three hours of the day where the power supply. Is not is not being utilised. So of course, you know Texas being a big power state, they welcome the miners with open arms to come in because they they realise they can work in in in, in real good, um, you know, conjunction with with each other to make sure they both benefit. The miners can benefit from the from the power at, at really good rates, and the power company gets paid for power that it would not normally receive a revenue from, and enables them to reinvest. In their company and, and and deliver more that way. So it's it, it works that way. Um, a final thing. Um, also, there's an element of luck. So if you think about Bitcoin mining, all these machines, these hundreds of thousands of mining machines, are literally chasing the number. So they're trying to determine what the next number is. This year, we've seen examples of individual machines actually gaining the block. So they've guessed the correct number. They're not. They're not part of a bigger, bigger organisation. They found it. I mean, it's, to be honest, it's a bit like when you buy a lottery ticket and you've won the lottery. That happened four times this year. So um, the miners are part of pools whereby they they will share the the, the sort of the 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 the, the pool winnings to, to a certain extent. And miners can basically um, have a contract with their mining pool to say. You know, if I'm supplying two percent of the um, of the of the uh, hash rate uh, of the global hash rate, I'd expect to be getting two cents of the Bitcoin, and that's how some of these mining pool contracts work. So you can pretty much get within about two or three percent your expectation of what you would receive, and you pay a, a small fee for that, maybe maybe one percent or two percent, but you get near enough. There are others where you can actually um, get paid based on the actual look of the mining pool. So if the mining pool does better. You might get slightly more. If it does less, you might get slightly less. But I would think most of the miners I've spoken to go for the first option, whereby they get a guaranteed return. Um, and it's not unusual for miners to be in more than one pool. So, um, you know, I spoke to one CEO a few months ago. They they use three pools um, and have different different types of contracts in each one of them. So they're sort of spreading their risk a little bit there. So, um the, the the look thing comes in, but it's it's a it's a small it's a small percentage. It's a small percentage. Definitely, yeah. No, I've spoken with a few pools, uh, or rather, a few companies that use multiple pools. As well, you always want to have like a, a fail safe if your first pool goes offline. Uh, moving the conversation over to multiples, though, in terms of these stock picks or these investment strategies, I'd be curious to get your take. Uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me, unfortunately, uh, but for a while there, a lot of these mining companies. Their Terra hash uh, trading multiple, I guess you could kind of make up a term right now on the spot, uh, was far above what the breaking or what the price was for just mining on your own. So let me explain this a little bit more. Uh, the cost per Terra hash is like a metric used 
uh, for what an ASIC is worth. Um, and then you could also use it for like how much Bitcoin you're going to mine. Um, there's a few different ways you can break out these metrics. And you can apply these same metrics to public companies as well and basically understand how much hash rate under management do they have and what does the multiple of their stock price trade above that. Uh, and so a lot of times we saw last year that a lot of public miners, the hash rate under management did not correlate very well with their stock price. Their stock prices were quite inflated over what their hash rate under management was compared to what a private company would have. Uh, and I think that just tells you about capital markets at the time, right? There's a lot of money floating through the system and these public miners were just taking advantage of it and their stock prices were trading uh, above where they naturally should uh, based on the fundamentals. I'd be curious to get your take on that. And I don't know if you've looked into it recently, uh, have any thoughts about uh, the collapse of a lot of these mining stocks over the last 60 to 90 days. It's been pretty dramatic. Some of them are down by as much as 60%. Uh, but yeah, I'll leave it there to get your take. If we if we go back to November the 12th, um, which was when sort of Bitcoin reached its, reached its close to its high of 69,000, and we look at these mining stocks from that date, the majority of them of the listed mining stocks, of which there are twenty nine currently, um, are in the region of eighty to eighty five percent lower than the, the share price is lower now than they were on the on the November the twelfth. That's a significant reduction. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I think there's a lot of um, capital in the markets. Um, there's a lot of um, retail investors going into these stocks without really doing any any due diligence or analysis. Um, some of them were over 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 inflated in, in valuations. Um, I mean, the, the the key thing is is when determining a valuation for a miner. The, the the most important thing is is what are they doing currently? You know, what are they mining currently? Let's you know, let's not get overworked up about what Mara's saying they're going to do next year. It's what they're doing now that's important. And actually, performance wise, they've not been doing very well at all. Um, they're usually in that sort of bottom two or three miners on my tables month in, month out. Um, so if I have as much faith in what they're doing now, how does that translate to what I think they'll be doing next year? So I, I do take you know some of the updates that these miners bring out, and they're, they're not the only one. In fact, there's, I'd, I'd go as far as to say that all the miners will try and put out the best, the best picture of their miner that they can possibly do without sort of like really um, it being dishonest about it. I mean, you know, Mara have purchased 13.3 of excess of miners, which they said they would have by mid middle of 2022. They have purchased those miners. The fact is, the delivery of those miners is not the same as purchasing them. They're going to be some are going to be delayed. Their infrastructure is not quite ready for those miners yet, so they've got a lot sat in in, in storage, waiting to be um, waiting to be turned on. Um, and so, those miners that are sat in storage. I did, a, I did a, a small calculation a couple of months ago to see what the impact of that was. And the impact to Mara in lost revenue was something like $30 million a month. That's a significant amount of money. Now, it's great that they've got those miners there, but that's what's cost, that's cost them an enormous amount of money. And that, that amount's rising as each, as each day. And that's at the current price of Bitcoin. That's not an inflated price of Bitcoin. Um, you know, if you look at the likes of Core Scientific, who who um, who've got a, a hash rate of over eight exahash in self mining and a similar amount in hosted mining, they're an enormous, they're a monster of a mining company, and they're planning to get to sort of thirty thirty two exahash by the end of end of this financial year. Um, but they deliver month in month out what they're supposed to do within within that sort of very small two or three percent. Um, Mara's just had that difficulty, and so, but what Mara benefited, benefited uh, along with Riot uh, against all of the companies was the fact that they were the first two U.S. miners to go uh, to be listed on the Nasdaq, and with that listing came lots of potential new customers, because you're going on to the prestigious Nasdaq, you know, um, stock exchange. Um, it opened the doors to the likes of Fidelity and BlackRock, who invested heavily in these two miners. It gave them an absolute edge on every other miner because they had the capital to go out there and not buy 10,000 miners. They could go out there and buy 60 or 70,000 miners. And they could buy, uh, in terms of Riot, they could buy infrastructure. They paid $650 million for their infrastructure in Winstone. And, you know, 
that other miners can't compete with that. So the Bit Farms, the Hive blockchains, the the Hut Eight, and the Argos blockchains, which I class as sort of like the middle the middle ground uh, miners, um, use Riot, Mara, and Core Scientific as a sort of like in in in, in sort of like Division One. They're the bigger miners. The, the Division Two miners can't compete with with, with that at the moment. Um, they're sort of still. They are Nasdaq listed now, but because they were late in Nasdaq listed, we've got we've got some sort of like a saturation of miners in the market. It's like investors thinking, which one do I go for? There's so many to choose from. There's 29, and I want to make sure I pick the right one. Well, I've heard of Mara and I've heard of Riot, and, I'm, and I'm, I think I've heard of Core Science because they're big miners. Um, does that mean that the other miners, um, you know, don't get don't get the same looking, um, and people are, are not picking miners on a based they're not based on valuation. They're based on probably the, that they're a known they're a known brand of miner, um, and that's where it becomes a comes an issue because if you look at valuations, um, and we look at the hash rate and compare that to what we, each company valued at, then you know um, Maras and Riots don't tend to stack up well from a valuation perspective um, compared to some others, albeit. Their stock price has come down significantly now, so those numbers need to be re- those numbers need to be redone, and just to see how it all 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 stands. But if all mines have come down, the same would apply. It would still mean that Mar and Wright are still more overvalued in comparison to some of those Division Two mines I spoke about. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And I, I would I would without looking at the numbers now, I, I sort of I I'd, I'd stand by that that point. Yeah, it's funny how easy money can get in and change things. And uh, Marathon is well known for having its access to capital markets. They did a really nice move you know, last year with that <sighs> debt convert or senior oh, debt note convert. Yeah. Um, yeah. That basically gave them like six million. F- million. Yeah. Yeah. So, so much capital for um, almost free, especially I, in an inflationary environment. I, I heard, well, on, on that point there, they, they went to the market for half a billion. And it was nearly four times oversubscribed. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and so they they went with a bigger number than five hundred million. Big, you know, so yeah. if you've got if you've got the opportunity to get that type of um, that type of funding at that cost, the one percent note cost. That's just that's like free money. That's that's, that's exactly exactly. Um, it's- Obviously, they have to they have to make good on the on the on the note itself. So you know they do that is a it is a debt to the to the to the company. Um, mm-hmm. Since that, then they they went out and did I think I did another five hundred uh, million equity at the market offering and achieved that very quickly. As did Riot. Riot did a, I think a six hundred six hundred fifty million at the market offering for shares, a dilution, and again within one month achieved the whole amount. Now six hundred fifty million is more than the market cap of the four middle miners individually so that just you know it's it's they have jumped the gun they were they were physically smaller miners when they went on the nasdaq but because of that nasdaq listing um they were able to jump everybody and just just get that that economies of scale go out there and buy miners you know if you're buying sixty thousand miners you're going to get a better deal than buying five thousand miners you know mm-hmm. the smaller miners five thousand is a lot of miners to them but if you're going and offering, you know, I want sixty thousand miners, and Mara paid, I think, when when mine, you know, when they paid something like four thousand a miner in um, April or May last year, but they paid and including that was a premium to get them delivered early, so they paid a little bit of a premium to jump the queue on the other miners, and that's where you have when you have the power of that amount of money, and I can tell you now, some other miners at the same time paid double that amount for their miners. So they've made a massive capital saving, which will, which will um, enable them to get their return on investment um, quickly. Because every miner looks—that's a key metric for a miner themselves. They want if they're going to deploy a miner in their organ, in their in their um, in their facility, they need to know how quickly that miner will recover its initial investment. And so I know some of the mining um, CEOs—they look at sort of like seven or eight months to recover that um, to cover that investment. And then the profits, they're fully profitable afterwards, um, and that's that's the, that's the difference with the big miners and the retail miners. It's you know you, you can get those cheap electricity costs to give you that uh, return on investment, so that you're you're able to then work really profitable, you know, for the for the balance of the life of the miner. Um, 
but yeah, last year very much overinflated. Um, I mean, just to just to look at Mara itself, I think in November it was valued at eight billion dollars market cap, and it's currently valued at one billion. Wow, so there's there's a change in there's a change in valuation. Yeah, I mean the whole crypto market has taken a, a nice hair trim. Absolutely, and then some. absolutely. Well, Bitcoin's not down by that by that amount. I think Bitcoin's probably down mm-hmm. by fifty five percent. So mm-hmm. we do see more volatility with regards to the mining stocks than we do with Bitcoin. So mm-hmm. there's more upside, but equally there's there's as much downside as well. So a lot more volatility. Um, yeah. But um, you know, hopefully, as as these miners get bigger and the volatility of Bitcoin reduces, then we might see that that volatility sort of slow down with the, with regards to the mining stocks themselves. But um, yeah, I just want to pitch a question to you uh, now that we're sort of on the topic. Uh, and, the, and the way you've laid it out is Marathon, Riot, and Core Scientific. They're so big, and they have so much capital at their disposals that they can they can not meet timelines and they can not meet deadlines and they can be okay. They can have lower mining performance. Obviously everyone's gunning to have as high mining performance as possible, but when you're insulated with that much capital, uh, nothing's going to happen at the same time though, are stock investors becoming a little bit wiser. Uh, if we enter into a bear market, are they going to, need to look at mining performance and are they going to punish some of these larger companies for not performing the way they should? Uh, I'd be curious to get your take on that. Perhaps we just continue to see uh, stock valuations for mining companies continue to be traded out of uh, ignorance, which is what it seems to be to date. Uh, but I'd be curious to get your take. Yeah, I think um, as as we get more and more information from these miners, and we're going to have more of a historic information available to us. Bearing in mind, you know, um, even if we look at say Bit Farms only started their mining a couple of years ago, and um, so it's it, you know if you've got sort of three or four years of of that information to show how they've grown financially, not just in exahash, um, then then it, it means it's more meaningful to to the to the to, to, to investors to go and do that due diligence and to check what the before they even consider making an investment in a company. Um, Mara and Riot um, have obviously obviously had that ability to 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 grow. Um, Mara's and Wright's production hasn't been um, as good as the other miners. Um, Wright's has been better than Mara's, but not not massively um, better. Um, but we'll see. We'll see from the Windstone facility. Now, I really like the setup there. They've got great infrastructure. Um, they're sort of future proofing themselves as well. So they've got that facility to grow into, and they've just announced. <laughs> they've just announced they're going for a, a one giga what facility another facility in texas and effectively that that sort of future proves them for probably the next five to ten years and they chose to go the infrastructure route whereas nearly all the miners that, that all the listed miners have gone infrastructure with the exception of mara mara have gone down the hosting route um they've tended to what they've decided was um if we feel that we can deploy our capital in miners and get a better rate of return than having infrastructure. Then why not just keep doing that? And I think that's that sounds great until you look at the performance, and then you say, "Well, it's not worked out great." In all honesty, um, your performance has been shocking for the last sort of six to twelve months. When do we see that improvement? And if I'm a host miner, um, say I'm core scientific. And I've got my self mining and my and my hosted facilities, and I've got issues with my hosted facilities. Which miners am I going to look after first, my own or the ones I'm managing? And that's sort of like uh, that's a quandary that you know, obviously that won't be in the contract. But you can bet your bottom dollar, Core Scientific will make sure its its own self mining is preserved far quicker than the miners that it's host that it's hosted. And that's that's my issue is the fact that infrastructure. I think in the long term we'll win the race. Um, infrastructure is expensive. We know it's expensive. Um, you know, uh, Windstone costs six hundred and fifty million dollars um, to, to buy that site there. Helios, um, if you take away the miners, is going to cost is going to cost half a billion to develop that site. Um, these are significant amounts. But if you look at the halvings, every time we have a halving. What that's what that's what that means is the energy prices will double for to mine a Bitcoin. So you're only going to get the next halving. You currently get nine hundred B 
Bitcoin mine today, you're going to get 450 mined at the next halving. That means the the energy, the hash rate won't won't go down, but you're deploying that global hash rate to only get half the Bitcoin, which means you're paying effectively half, uh, sorry, twice as much energy to, to mine one Bitcoin. So if we look at, say, two, two halvings ahead, at the moment, uh, most of the miners probably paying around eight to 10,000 in energy cost per Bitcoin. That could take the price of mining a Bitcoin, allowing for a difficulty as well at the same time as the hash rate increases, maybe thirty to 35,000 a Bitcoin in, say, four or five years' time. That's significant. And if you're, a host, if you're hosting your, your miners and the, an agreement is based on a, a percentage of the energy costs, what sounds okay now as a percentage of 8,000 is going to be a whole different ball game when you're saying a percentage of 35,000. That, 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 that hosting element of the, of the energy cost starts becoming quite significant. And, you know, I'd be interested to see if any of the, if, if Mar have actually done a full business case to work out, as I would as an accountant, where that break even happens because we've got 118 years left of mining it's not it's not finishing in four years time so as energy costs keep going up and up and up and i'm not even allowing for the cost of energy global energy prices increasing i'm just taking what the miners are stating at the moment as their cost we know even the texas costs are going up at the moment for miners they're not fully disclosing that yet but they're not getting all of them getting that sort of two to two and a half cents rate forever that that rate will change if the global um prices don't don't start um coming down all mines will be paying more for their for their energy um so it goes back again it goes it goes to see which are the best uh, a best place going forward um and it's it's interesting quandary it's not like um <coughs> it's not like one one given um you know uh, set, set set of metrics works for everyone You've got to really go into looking at a number of metrics to see which one, um, which one is you know which one, which which company comes out best. Yeah, the hosted solution is definitely interesting. Um, yeah. Just w- one other question, if I can add on here, interested to get your take. Do you think there's a case for some of these middle group miners uh, to join the premier division or the first division of miners, like the riots and marathons of the world? Uh, during a bear market, or do you see sort of a shakeup, or do you do you see some of these larger miners like Marathon or Riot going back down into the middle class of of miners just because of minor performance issues? It's gonna it's gonna be interesting. Um, the, I mean, with regards to all these miners declaring really big growth uh, growth increases over the next twelve months, um, and most of them have actually got committed orders for miners over the next 12 months. So it's not like they're aspiring to get there when they're quoting. Um, so Marathon have got 13.3 of mine, of, of, will have 13.3 of miners during this year. So by the end of quarter three, which is their revised target now, those miners will be in place. They've ordered them. They're, they're actually been delivered. They're just waiting for the facility to, to be able to take those miners. Riot, again, they've got big orders in going forward. Um, Argo have got 5.5 XH of committed orders. Now, the one thing that, that um, will, will be an issue is, um, and so listeners who may not be aware of, of how these contracts work, is generally these miners, when they make an, a significant order, they, they pay like at something like maybe 35% of the order as a deposit. And then there'll be a second payment, which will cover the period of the lead time between order and delivery. So it's taking um, nine to 12 months lead time to get the miners once you've ordered them. So you might make a number of payments during that period of another 35% of the total amount. And then towards the end, so maybe three or four weeks before actual delivery, you make the final payment. So those miners are fully paid before you actually receive any of them. So, and that's generally... Uh, a, a, like a bit main contract will 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 um will go that route and i'm sure all the other mining providers have something very very much similar to that you know work on a three payment structure so with these miners who've ordered these they've obviously paid the big deposits they're already paying the monthly payments however as we are sort of appearing to be in this sort of bear cycle at the moment how are some of these miners going to get the necessary funding available 
to pay those balances off because I think a lot of people had aspirations of Bitcoin being at significantly higher price last year. And I don't think anybody really anticipated we'd be down at thirty thousand pounds at the moment. So sorry, thirty thousand dollars at the moment. So um what we heard at the at the conference last week in London, the AIM conference, um, was that was there, there's an anticipation that up to fifty percent of orders may be defaulted in twenty twenty two. Now that might not that might not necessarily be the big big miners. That might be some of the really small miners and retail um, sort of miners who've gone out there and and, and made these orders and um, thought they'd be able to, to to fund it because Bitcoin would appreciate in value and be able to sell a bit of Bitcoin to fund those last. But that that's not been the case. So if those numbers are true and um, there were some serious um, uh, people making those statements at the conference um that will be an interesting um to to to, to see that um to see that roll out how that's going to affect any of the miners because you know i think riot and mara will be in a in a reasonable position but they have got big orders out there to pay and they want to and, and riot wants to you know it's it's buying a new site and building a new site so it's going to be interesting how how this landscape works in this bear cycle i think the middle the middle um division of miners are going to find it diff- more difficult because I, th- I, th- I think they'll have to start selling their Bitcoin. So those that have said, you know, we're, we're using this HODL strategy. And that was another interesting point that came out. Be- if before that conference, most miners would HODL their Bitcoin. Now I'm starting to hear some of them would sell when it was a necessity to sell. It's, it's no longer, you know, because they're going to need that funding. And and if you think of the share prices at the moment, the dilution doesn't really become an option anymore because the share price, the share prices are so low and the market capital is so low. If you were to take, uh, say, Argo blockchain, if they did a 20% dilution, it would get them sort of 40 to $50 million, um, which, which when they're looking to, to, to buy, you know, to, 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 to find final payments to cover you know, thirty, forty thousand miners, it's not really going to cover that 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 final payment. So, you know, that that Argo have got, you know, they've they've managed to raise some money through debt and they've got Bitcoin, but I believe they'll have to sell Bitcoin to meet some of these obligations. Um same with Hive, they'll have to sell Ethereum as they've been doing all year to meet some of their obligations. And, you know, Bitfarms, um, who who've got a a five hundred million at the market offer as we speak, so they've got this you know, um, in place, are they willing to actually utilise that that facility, knowing the bit the bit bit farm share price is really low, and they're not going to get what they expected? It's different when you go out to market and you think it, the share price is six dollars, but when it's one dollar eighty, it's a whole different ball game, you know. Um, and we know from we know that shareholders, the last resort for shareholders is dilution. They don't want dilution in the company because obviously their um, their elements of the company becomes that much smaller. So mm-hmm. then uh, even, shareholders are now even being more um, agreeable to Bitcoin being sold before dilution. Yeah, the capital so markets been, have definitely changed over the last. Yes, yeah. s- but it, but in, in a way, capital markets have, have, have you know changed in the fact that um, companies have been able to raise debt. So that. You know, 15 months ago, that was no, you couldn't do it. So, you know, you only had selling Bitcoin or dilution as your as your two levers. Now there are three levers. And in fact, as the energy companies start coming into this space, as a fourth lever, lever so the fourth lever will be partnerships. So you, you might get an energy company coming in and saying, we want to partner with you. We have, you know, an immense amount of uh, capital available to to buy miners but we haven't got the expertise in running a mining company. So, you know, that's 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 an option that's coming onto the table now. And um, I, I believe, I think, um, is it Exxon have already sort of made a move into the Bitcoin mining space. And, and um, as uh, Fred Thiel um, suggested a few months ago, he thinks in five years' time, it will be predominantly be energy companies running the, running the show. Yeah, I mean, last week, and we'll publish, I think, this episode tomorrow, J Energy uh, partnered with Mawson and TPL, which was a, a big move for that 
energy slash landowner provider in Texas to jump into Bitcoin mining. Uh, Anthony, I really want to thank you for your time on the show. We'll definitely have to have you on again. Your your wealth of knowledge on all things Bitcoin mining and public markets. Uh, I do want to ask one last question. I like to ask guests on the show, and that is for a hash rate prediction to end up the year. A lot of people beginning the year were saying 300x a hash easily, but well, we're midway through the year almost, probably five months into the year, and we're only about 220x a hash. So do you think we can get another 80x a hash online by the end of the year? What's your prediction? Um, so couple couple of points. One thing that uh, most um, viewers of the podcast won't realize is that Kazakhstan isn't online at the moment. So when we say 222 exahash, Kazakhstan's government have said the 31st of May will be the earliest date they allow them to switch back on. And they're only going to allow um, the white miners to, to switch back on. So there are a lot of um, black market miners in in Kazakhstan that aren't following the protocols to get um, their uh, facilities approved by the government, but also approved by the energy provider as well. So they need two approvals to mine in Kazakhstan. Um, half half of the miners have have got that approval, and and from what I'm hearing from a few sources, and I lived in Kazakhstan for three years, so I, I know the environment out there, um, is that the 31st of May uh, is is the day that they're, they're, they're hoping that they get switched on. So Potentially, um, that could be another ten or eighteen percent added to the to the hash rate. But going back to the start of the year, I, I was fully expecting three hundred to three hundred and twenty-five x hash by the end of the year. I'd probably be revising that down now to maybe two seventy-five by the end of the year. Um, what we're seeing is we're seeing some of the big miners, and we've already spoke about the Mara um, Bit Farms have revised their uh, exahash target from eight to six by the end of the year. Um, Hot Eight revised their target of six from mid of the mid twenty twenty two to the end of twenty twenty two, and other miners are, are, are sort of are going to be in that same bracket. It's 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 going to be down to you know expectation management of expectation. I think you know these numbers are startling. Um, you know, Mara have got those machines in you know literally on site in storage ready, ready to be put in and switched on, but it's a case of how many machines can they physically um per day per per week to get to get that hash rate up um it's a it's not this is not plugging in one or two miners this is plugging in eighty thousand miners and a good a good operation team um will probably could probably do fifteen hundred a day on a good day nothing's got goes wrong and they've got the, you know they've got the right team team working together like a formula one team changing the tires on on a car you know these. You know if they get that, they can do fifteen hundred, maybe maybe to two thousand a day. But you know how long will it take to put you know nearly a hundred thousand miners and maras from the garage to install, and are they going to achieve quarter three, which is literally four months away now? So they've revised their target by three months because it's not happening by the end of June, which is literally four weeks away. But are we still are we still realistically going to get that hash rate by the end of that period? So. All these factors play into that, and that's why I'm probably thinking 275 is going to be closer to the mark. 275. So a little bearish, but not too bearish. Not too bearish, think, no. no we're, 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 still seeing, we're still seeing growth, but not as not the growth <laughs> that we were expecting and, and as quickly as we're expecting. And it'll be good when I speak to uh, Jason Les from Riot on, on Wednesday and from Dan Roberts uh, for Iris uh, tomorrow morning, um, mm-hmm. because those two have got quite significant growth strategies this year. And I will, I'll be asking, that's one of my main questions is, you know, how confident to your shareholders are you, are you going to be achieving those hash rates in the, in the times that you stated? And at what point are you going to be amending it if necessary? So mm-hmm. we'll see how that how that works out. Yeah, I look forward to seeing those numbers myself. And when we find out what things look like, we'll have to have you back on. But Anthony, thank you so much for joining the Compass Podcast. Again, just a wealth of knowledge about capital markets and public miners. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me.